Thank you. Many people say that life is measured in time, but I disagree. I believe it is measured in moments. We've started with this every week, but I'm going to do it again. So y'all sat here for eight weeks of this. Just act like Christians and give me head nods, okay? For instance, you never remember a whole year, a whole month, or a whole week, or even a day, just a whole day in your life, but there are certain moments in your life that you will always remember. You know, for, for instance, there's, there's sad moments. You know, I talked about this each week when my father passed away, my grandparents, mentors of mine. You know, I remember those moments, okay? I may not remember the years. I may not remember the most, but I remember those moments. But then you remember happy moments in life, like my children being born, my wedding day, the day I was saved, and the day that God called us to start this church. Christian warriors, one single decision in one single moment could change the entire outcome of your life, someone else's life, or most importantly, it could help grow God's kingdom. Amen? You see, we have no idea, guys, what God can do in a single moment with one single act of obedience from us. No idea. This sermon series is entitled Warrior Obedience. For the last two months, we have been looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 22. This is where God, our coach, explains how he expects his church to perform. And like any great coach, God has very clearly laid out what he expects from us in a game plan. And with this game plan, he has given us a playbook that contains 12 plays for us to follow as a church. These 12 plays, guys, are 12 commands that God expects his church to be obedient to. Must be obedient to. And I assure you, Christian Warriors Church, if we're obedient to these 12 plays, we will execute his game plan to perfection and become the obedient church he wants and expects us to be. We've studied the first 11 plays from this playbook over the weeks past, so we're going to review these real quick. If we could pull up those 11 plays. Honor your church leaders. Live peacefully with each other. Hold each other accountable. Take care of the weak. Be patient with everyone. Retaliate with good, not evil. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Always be thankful. Do not quench the Holy Spirit and test prophecies before rejecting them. If you've missed any of these uh, sermons from this series, guys, you can catch up on YouTube. They're all on there. Uh, this week, we're going to pick up where we left off, but first, I want to read all of 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit, do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said, hold on to what is good, and stay away from every kind of evil. If you could pull up 1 Thessalonians 22 for me, 522. So this is the next play in God's church playbook. Stay away from every kind of evil. We're going to finish this church playbook up today. So we as a church are commanded, again, to stay away from evil. We need to understand what God considers evil, though. So let's look at the biblical definition of evil. That which opposed to God, that, excuse me, that which is opposed to God, that which is the opposite of God, and that which is contrary to God and God's word. So basically, anything that's not of God is evil. Y'all follow that? Yeah, I should just put that up there. That would have been an easier description. But this sounded smarter. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got to do my best. There's a lot of scripture, guys, that we can study to understand what God considers evil. But God gave me a verse uh, that, that, he, that I'm going to teach for, for for this sermon. And that's 1 Corinthians 5.11. Let's go there. You are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, 
or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. Hi, Mikey. Missed you, man. Now, right here, Paul is telling us to stay away from people who claim to be believers but do these evil things, guys. And since we as a church are believers, this verse is a good guideline of what evil is and what we need to stay away from, right? I think everybody in this room considers themselves a believer. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's better. That's right. But what we also need to catch, guys, and this is what Paul's trying to teach, is we are not only commanded to stay away from every kind of evil, but we as Christians should also make sure that we do not have the appearance of evil in our lives as well. Christian warriors, you are a walking, talking testimony to others, and because of this, you should do all you can to make sure your walk always reflects the example of Jesus Christ. To do this, you must make sure your reputation of being a believer is protected. So not only do you need to stay away from evil, again, you need to make sure you never give off the appearance of evil. Because guys, I promise you, even just the smallest appearance of evil can destroy your reputation and in turn, the growth of God's kingdom. I need you to keep that in mind today, guys, as we go through this, series, through this sermon. Uh, with each one of these evil acts, I want to pull them up where, where Paul, we're going to break all these down. Let's, let's look at that list, what Paul's talking about here. Okay, these are, the, these are the six evil acts that he's put down in that verse that we just read in 511. Sexual sin, greed, idolatry, abuse, excessive drinking, and cheating others. Okay, so that's the ones that Paul is talking about here. As a Christian, we are to stay away from and not have the appearance of any type of sexual sin. This is the first one we're going to talk about this. So, it's always weird to talk about sex from the pulpit. But we're going to talk about it biblically, okay? So when it says to stay away from it, there's, there's, there's only one way that God allows that, and that is through marriage. That is between a husband and and a wife, a man, and a woman. That is all that is ever between. No one else is allowed into that covenant. It is only man and wife, okay? I think we all know that. I think we can all catch on to that. But then, I want to talk about, okay, so, so I'm going to talk to the young people. That's what I want to talk to. I'm going to talk to young people, okay? So what I need you young people to understand, those of y'all that think sex is not a big deal, okay? First of all, it's a major deal. That is actually... Ooh, it's going to catch some of y'all. That is actually how God says you're married. The Bible says a husband will leave his father and mother, and the man and woman will come together and join as one flesh. What do y'all think that means? Doesn't take rocket science. When that happens, you're married in God's eyes. Some of y'all are like, man, I had a bunch of wives, or I had a bunch of husbands. <laughs> now, keep in mind, keep in mind, I want y'all to grasp this. I don't want you to feel guilty for mistakes that you've made in your past. It's all about when your walk was started. It's all about, you know, if you've made those mistakes in the past, and in the last three years you've become strong in your walk with God, you know better, you're good, Okay. The problem is, is when this act happens outside of marriage and there's no conviction. That's a sexual sin. Okay? Some of you parents are like, man, I'm so glad he called out my teenagers. A big issue that we have with sexual sin in the world today is lust and pornography. That's a big, big problem. You know, I, I, I counsel a lot of young people when it comes to pornography and and listen i'm gonna stand up here at this stage and i'm gonna be brutally honest with y'all okay when i was younger when men my age and women my age were younger we didn't have access to it like they have today and i, and I really need you adults to grasp this this is a battle that y'all are going to be fighting with your teenage children for a long time and it's not just teenage children. Now we've got adults that have also, now that this easy access is there, you can literally pick up your phone and be there in seconds. It has become a major, major attack from the devil. Major attack. 
Guys, again, he's telling us to stay away from sexual sin. This is something, and this is what I highly encourage to people that I counsel through this. You need someone to hold you accountable. And no one can hold you accountable if you don't tell anybody. That's called a hidden sin. It's pretty bad. Because what happens is a hidden sin is going to bring you down. What happens is when you have a hidden sin, it's literally like you're walking around and the devil is on your back and you're having to carry him everywhere that you go. You need to open up to someone. That's why I have so much respect for people that come to me with this issue. But what I'm telling you is, is have somebody that can hold you accountable. Go to a brother or a sister or your spouse. Be honest with them. Let them know the issue. And here's what I really need you to grasp. Really need you to grasp this. Again, this is a major issue today. It was not a big issue 10, 15, 20 years ago. Okay? So what I need my brothers and sisters and my spouses to understand is be understanding of that. That is the devil attacking. Don't attack the spouse. Don't attack your brother and sister. If they come to you with this problem, love them. Hold them accountable. You attack them, that's not going to do any good. All you're doing is the same thing Satan's doing. He's attacking them. Lift them up. Help them. Encourage them. Get them help. Get them help. Get, get them to reach out to me. If you don't want to help them, bring them to myself. Bring them to leadership. Let us help them through that process. Because, guys, I'm telling you, it's a major, major issue today. We actually preached a sermon on lust, uh, I don't it's been about a year ago, and, and, I, and forgive me if I get the statistic wrong, but I do remember that it was between the ages of 13 and 20, this is men, okay, so this is young men we're talking about here, 13 to 20, 93% had watched porn. Be honest with you, probably six of the other 7% were lying. I'm just being honest. Here's the kicker, same age group, females. 82%. 18%, okay, so that probably, I'd say, we'll give them 16% will probably lie. Guys, it's a major problem in our world today. It's a major attack that Satan is throwing out constantly in our faces through social media, the internet, TV shows that we watch, YouTube, whatever else it is that you look at, think about it. Heck, you can watch a football game, and you're going to have lust all in your face. What I'm telling you is when those things happen, when those things occur, you do all you can to not look at it. Fight it away. The Bible tells us in James to resist the devil and he will flee from you. So when you see those things, you, you resist. And guess what? He'll flee. So the problem is, is if you still have that issue, if he's not resisting, you're not fleeing. It's plain and simple. You have to help. You have to fight the battle, guys. You have to do that. All right, I'm going to move off that. Keep in mind that this, uh, we are not only commanded to stay away from these evil things, from this, from this sexual sin, but we must also not have the appearance of sexual sin. Don't be alone with somebody with the opposite, from the opposite sex. Just, just don't do it. I'm just being honest with you. I realize that there's times maybe at work that you have to be. My suggestion there is always keep the doors open. Always keep your distance. Don't sit right next to them. Guys, because I'm telling you right now, as a pastor, I take this very serious. And a lot of you females that I've talked to know that. Because as soon as you reach out, I always say, i got to have a female there. Here's your options, or you can bring somebody. Because I will not sit down with a female by myself. If I'm at work, office door's always open. Always. And I do not sit next to them. I sit across the table from them. Plus, we got cameras all over this church, anywhere that I counsel, same thing at my jewelry store. We do that so the appearance of sexual sin does not pop up. Guys, there was a pastor locally. I don't remember how many years ago this was, but it's been a while, 20, 25 years ago. There was a young lady that came up to him and wanted to visit with him after service one day. He pulls her aside. Everybody else had left the church, visited with her, prayed with her. She goes home, tells her parents that he molested her. They didn't have cameras. They didn't have anybody else present. Come to find out about three years later, by the way, this made local, this like news everywhere, right? Front page that this happened, this pastor sexually molested this young girl. Years later, it goes to court. 
the girl's conviction set in. She sat on the stand and said, my parents didn't want that pastor in that church. They made me say that. Get this. Do you all think that was on the front page? <laughs> didn't even make the paper. You remember this. Guys, one act of the appearance of sin can affect an entire church. What do y'all think happened to that church? That's why we take it so serious. You should do the exact same thing. Everything that I just told y'all that we do as a church, men and women, y'all should do the exact same thing. Protect your walk. Protect your appearance. Protect your testimony. I know the next one is greed, but we're going to come back to that. That's where he changed it on me. So we're going to jump to the next one, which is idolatry. Idolatry is when you put an idol or something else ahead of God. This is when something else means more to you than your own personal relationship with God. This could be money, fame, lust, a hobby, social media, video games, TV, or even a job. Even a job. If you put any of these things ahead of God, you are an idolater. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have a hobby, guys, but it should never be more important than your relationship with God. Never. And it should also never be more important than your family because 1 Timothy chapter 5 tells us that besides our own personal relationship with God, our family is our number one ministry on this earth. Y'all know this. We've taught this many times. So to God, you are also an idolater. If you allow hobbies to hurt your relationship with your family. When I was, uh, this has been years ago, I used to be a big golfer, right? Love to play golf. And I can tell you right now, the last golf tournament, like real golf tournament, I played in a few little four-man scramble stuff, but I mean like an individual competitive real golf tournament, I can tell you the last time I played in one. And it was at Northridge Country Club, and it was the club championship. And it was a three-day tournament. I went to my wife, told Amanda, I said, hey, I'm going to go play in this golf tournament. At the time, Caroline hadn't been born yet. Or maybe, no, she just was. I believe she was just a baby. But she said, well, you know, Sadie, one of her little friends, got this birthday party this weekend. I really wanted you to go with me. I said, well, I'm going to go play golf. Because I was stupid. So, guys, I want you to think about this. I get up there to tee off on the first hole, and all I can think about is I shouldn't even be here right now. I played terrible. And I withdrew from that golf tournament. Never in my life I ever withdrew from anything. But I withdrew from that golf tournament. I never forget walking up to the guy that ran the tournament. And I said, man, I am so sorry that I have to withdraw. And he looked at me. He was like, man, no, what are you talking about? And I looked at him. I said, I'm supposed to be in my family right now. And I love what he said. Then get out of here. Men, I need you to understand something. Your golf clubs, <laughs> when you're sitting on your deathbed, your golf clubs ain't going to be sitting next to you. Let me, hang on. They might be, but you ain't going to be able to play. <laughs> that 12-point buck that you shot is already dead, and it ain't going with you. That bowling trophy you know who's going to be at your deathbed? Your family. Your loved ones. Don't put anything, anything above your family. And never put anything ahead of God. Don't have the appearance of this either, guys. <laughs> you're missing church on Sunday, first thing they think, you're at the golf course. You're not at an event that your family's at. Your whole family's there, and you're not there. You just gave the appearance of idolatry. What's more important than your family in that moment? I know that hurt. I know. I've been there, but it's the truth. I'm just trying to tell y'all what the Bible says. Just don't do it. Don't be mad at me. The next sinful act that's mentioned here is abuse. This one's going to be quick because it's pretty simple, guys. To God, any kind of abuse is completely unacceptable. Completely. We are commanded to never abuse anyone physically, sexually, emotionally, or most importantly, spiritually. 
We talked about this two weeks ago, false prophets, false pastors, so forth. They're abusing people spiritually. That completely destroys somebody's walk. But no abuse is ever allowed, guys. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 18 said, if anyone abuses one of my children, I'm paraphrasing, okay? I'm going to put this in, in, in country terms, okay? If anyone abuses my children, they would be better off to stand at the spillway at Lake Wright Patman and tie a 100-pound weight to them and jump off. That's literally what he says. You can go look it up, Matthew 18. Well, I mean, it's not literally what he says, but you know what I'm saying. I'm parable in this, okay? Is that a word, parabling? I'm, I'm, whatever, y'all don't worry about it. All kidding aside, guys, that's how serious Jesus takes abuse. It is not allowed. It is completely unacceptable. I don't think I got to go any further on that. I think we get it. The next sinful act we are commanded to stay away from is excessive drinking or being a drunkard. Now, this does not mean you can never have a drink. However, you need to be very aware of your surroundings when you do. If you've got a brother or sister that's struggling with it, don't drink around them. Come on now. Be very aware of your surroundings. We don't want to be the reason that one of our brothers or sisters stumble and fall. We want to be the reason that they get lifted back up. And they stay there. Again, not saying you can't have a drink. That's okay. Just don't. Again, check your surroundings. And then the other thing is, is know your limits. Know your limits. All right, I really... Okay. So, so a long time ago, a very long time ago, I, I, this is the honest truth, I had... I, 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 you know, back in my BC days, you know, I'd drink a little bit. You know, I'd have a good time, sometimes way too much good time. BC days. Now I have a really good time. I don't need any of that stuff. Amen? Okay. But, but this, was, this was actually after this. This was after I started my walk. Okay. See, because in my BC days, I had pretty good tolerance. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could get out there and get after it like a fool. So, so then I quit. And, and, oh my gosh, it's been 10 years ago. Okay, so it's been exactly 10 years ago. It was Amanda's 10-year class reunion. And uh, we were all at the country club in Atlanta. And there was one of our friends there, and he was buying everybody shots. Well, I was like, man, a shot ain't going to hurt. You know, I'll take a shot. That was stupid. <laughs> stupid. Now, keep in mind now, this is before pastor days, okay? I need y'all to, to grasp this. So it's 10 years ago, okay? It's six years before he called me to plant the church because he knew it was going to take six years to repair from this night, okay? <laughs> Y'all, he kept feeding shots, and, and like an idiot, I kept taking it. I was like, well, I don't feel nothing. I don't feel nothing. I don't feel nothing. And then I started to feel something. <laughs> Y'all, there's no exaggeration at the time. I had a black Ford F-150, and it was out in the parking lot. And I was looking for Amanda because I was going to say, we got to go home. Like, I'm struggling. I can't keep my eyes open, y'all. And, and Amanda looked at me. She didn't like that. She said, this is my 10-year reunion. I'm going to stay. I said, okay. I said, I'm going to go take a nap in the truck. I didn't make it in my truck. I literally put my head on the bed of my truck, and I fell asleep just like this <laughs> for 30 minutes. Now, now here's, here's what I'm getting at. All kidding aside, let's get back to this. Her 20-year class reunion is in a few weeks. What if I do that now? What does that appearance set off? We won't have anybody from her 20, from her class coming to church. I promise you that. Y'all understand what I'm saying here? Guys, even though honest, this is the honest truth, I didn't mean to get that way. But I allowed it to catch me and the appearance was not good. Be very careful. Know your limits. Amen? And don't take shots. That's just stupid anyway. <laughs> the last sinful act Paul tells us to restrain. Is this the last? The show is. Okay. The last one, except for, yeah, I'll go back to that one, is, uh, is, is cheating. Is people that cheat people. Okay. The other translation for this says, stay away from a swindler. A swindler. A swindler is someone who gets money dishonestly by deceiving or cheating people. Guys, you should never do this because this act could financially hurt an individual's future, but even more important, it could hurt their family's future. 
okay? So there used to be a doctor that, that uh, this story was told back where I was from, but what he used to do is these people would come in and they didn't have any money. This is a long time ago, okay? They didn't have no money, but they had land. And, and they would need some little minor something done, and he'd say, okay, just give me that property, and I'll take care of you. That's not right. This man had a lot of land, and he made a lot of money. But he also had to die with that. I pray every day because I know who this man was. I pray every day that conviction finally set in on him. But that's the type of people that he's warning us about here. Swindlers. People that cheat others. Again, just like the rest of these sins, Paul is telling us that, that not only should we stay away from it, but not have the appearance of it. So I want to talk about that real quick, and that is be very careful about, if you're a, a business owner or something, be careful about who your business partner is. Be very careful about that. There was a business a few years back that was doing something unfair to someone, and I knew two individuals that left the business. And what's crazy is that business ended up profiting. But these two individuals, they didn't regret it at all. They could sleep at night. That's another thing, man. If you're a swindler, there's no peace in your life. How can you go to, really, how? Like, the golden rule is pretty simple and it's biblical. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Don't fall into this trap of money, okay? Which brings me to, and I want to go back to, Greed. Okay, we're going to go back to that. Now, guys, again, he changed this on me literally this morning, so y'all be a little patient with me. I don't want to fall off track. So the next one, of course, is greed. We're commanded not to be greedy. So it only makes sense that in order to make sure we're not greedy is to counterattack greed with the opposite, and that is generosity. That is, to be, that is to be generous, okay? We must be generous with what we have. We must be generous to others and always be willing to lend a helping hand to all those that are in need. Now, I want you to catch this. The Bible is not just telling us to be generous with our money. It's not just about your treasure, guys. We should also, also be very generous with our time and our talents as well, okay? When we were Christian Warriors Ministry, I, I remember this. There, there was a man, he was a disabled vet, and uh, the city was getting on to him because his yard was getting so bad. Somebody reached out to us as a ministry, and we had three men that would go by there and mow that man's yard. That's not money. That's your time. When you go and you comfort someone that's in need and that's hurting, it's time. It's not money. It's time. See, so many times we get caught up in, you know, to not be greedy, we need to give money. Guys, I promise you right now, and I really need y'all to grasp this, God can do a whole lot with your generosity that's not money than money. The act of love that comes from generosity, he can do a whole lot more with that than a check that you write. I promise you that. Okay. We're going to go to... Uh, Again, this is where he changed on me, guys. We're going to go to Romans chapter 12. We'll give you a little bit of time to get there if you get your Bibles. I'm going to try and close this out. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to read verses 1, verse 4, 6 through 8, and then we're going to go to 9, and I'm going to close this out. Hey, Bo. Can you find me a serving card? Never mind, I got one. Yeah. Yeah, y'all heard me. I said serving card. Get over it. 
You know, it's funny earlier, man, Bo was getting on y'all about serving. You can hear crickets up in here. You know the Holy Spirit's working when all y'all are silent. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) We're going to look at verse 1 first, and then we're going to go to 4, and then 6 through 8 and 9. Just follow along. Just go to 1 first. Romans 12, 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. You know, I shouldn't even go any further. I shouldn't go any further. You ain't got time to be generous and help others when for what he's done for us? Are you kidding me? You go get nailed to a cross, see how it feels. Sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I plead with you because all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. He's talking about your body. The kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way you worship him. Being generous and loving on others and helping others is how we truly worship what he's done for us. Y'all following me? Y'all ain't catching it. Let's keep moving. Let's go to verse 4. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Now we're talking about the church. We're talking about the church house. No, we're not. We're talking about all Christians. We're talking about God's church house. It ain't just CW Church. This is the community, this is God's house, this is is God's church that we're talking about here. We're all one part of the body of Christ. Amen? Okay. Now we're going to go six through eight. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness or mercy to others, do it gladly. Guys, I'm going to break this down for y'all real quick. What he's saying is, is, I've given you a dang gift. You need to use it. He's given you one of these gifts. If you consider yourself a Christian, I promise you, it's a promise in this book. You can go read the whole chapter. He's telling you that if you consider yourself a Christian, you have at least one of those gifts. At least one. And guess what you can do with it? Serve his church. Now, you consider you're a part of Christian Warriors Church, you need to serve this church. I know, like, Mike, here we go. You're going to beat us up about serving? Yeah, no, actually, I'm not. It's biblical. Guys, you're saved to serve. Plain and simple. All he's done for us, he saved us. The least we can do is use our bodies to serve others. You can do it in this church house. If I'm making you mad today, you can go somewhere else and do it in another church house. I don't care where you do it, but you do it for God's kingdom. We've got too many people. Okay, we got too many lazy Christians. I hate to say it, but it's the truth. And the reason I can say that is, is because I was one for a long time. I knew he was calling me, and I wouldn't do it because I was lazy. Guys, what I'm trying to get at is that gift that he's given you. He's given you one of them. We just read them off. I promise you, one of them snapped in your head. I promise you it did. Maybe multiple. And I knew good and well that I had certain gifts, but I didn't have the courage. I was a coward to step up and use that gift. One of my mentors read this to me when he saw the gifts I had. And I broke down. And that's when I realized, God, everything that you've given me is not mine. 
the gifts that I have, I didn't earn. I didn't gain these. You gave them to me. Why am I not honoring you with them? Guys, Bojo's talking about the children's hall. Here in a few weeks, we've got something that we're going to show you guys for the, the, the plans of the future of this church. Okay, so I know I've been talking about God's kingdom. We're going to talk about this church, which is a part of God's kingdom. In order for us to grow into the vision that God has for this church, y'all going to love this. I ain't going to ask you for your money. I'm going to ask you for your time and your talent. That's what I'm going to ask you for. Money will come. I ain't worried about that. God has supplied everything we needed. I'm not worried about that. Again, I've told you this before. I'm not going to teach you how to offer, how to give offerings. I'm going to teach you how to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and I'll let him tell you what to give, okay? That, that, that's how we do this. But I am going to ask for your time and your talent because that's what he tells us. We've got a great future at this church. Y'all saw that last week. We're just getting started, and we do need help. We should have, we should be, we, we should have an abundance of servers. Uh, this is a weird word, but we should be overserved. You know what I'm saying? There's a serving list in the back of these chairs. If you don't see one there, you just let me know. I'll get you one, okay? I want you to look down the list. I'm not going to go down this list. Just look down the list. One of them's going to jump out at you. What I'm asking you to do is two things. You pray over it, number one. Make sure that's where he wants you. And then number two, have the courage. It's the least we can do for what he's done for us. And we're not asking you to serve every Sunday. If we get enough servers, like once a month. In fact, we looked it up not too long ago. If we had enough servers, you'd serve three times a year. That's just the children's area. If we had enough servers... Three times a year. You're telling me that for everything he's done for us, you can't serve three times a year. I love y'all, but, but this is past my limit. We've got to be obedient to his call for us to serve. And then there's one more thing, guys. Verse 9, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Leave, li love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. So here's, here's the last thing I'm going to tell you. If you don't think you got any gifts, we all got the gift of love in us if we're a child of God. Just love on people. Love on people. And this church is doing an amazing job with that. But here's what I'm going to tell you. If you've got this major gift of loving on people, guess what? You can love on kids. <laughs> you can love on people that walk through that front door and greet them. We got places for people that love people. Let's go review. Nah, I ain't worried about that. Let's close this out. I want to look at 1 Thessalonians 5. Verses 23 and 24. So we have been going over these 12. In fact, yeah, pull up those 12 uh, uh, plays for me, please, for the playbook. Okay, so this is all of them, right? Honor your church leaders. Live peacefully with each other. Hold tight to account. Uh, take care of each uh, of the weak. Be patient with everyone. Retaliate with good, not evil. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Always be thankful. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Test prophecies before rejecting them. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now pull up that verse for me. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ returns again. God will, God will, guys, when it says God, he will, it's a promise. God will make this happen for he who calls you is faithful. So you're saying, now wait a minute. Now how, how is that? How can I be, you know, my whole spirit, my whole soul, and my whole body be kept blameless until Jesus returns? Like how in the world can that happen? It says God will make this happen. He made it happen when his son died on that cross and he left us the Holy Spirit. 
all these things that we've talked about. Every single play in the playbook, every single act of evil that we've got to stay away from, God gave us an answer. It's the Holy Spirit. Build your relationship. Get close to him. Hear him. Jesus said himself, what did he say? My, my, my sheep will hear my voice. They will recognize it. And they will follow me. The Holy Spirit is trying to tell you what to do. That nudge that you feel. Guys, that's not a coincidence. You know what I'm talking about. Those situations you're in, you're like, should I do this? Should I do this? And you feel something like, don't go over there. That's the Holy Spirit. And your pride is like, oh, look over there. Build your relationship with the Holy Spirit, and God will make it happen. Because guess what? He's faithful. Amen?